All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Fridays with Fiscal. We're going to go over the February 2023 recaps for all the applications. So we'll start on the wiki. So everybody's familiar where, where to find them under the meetings and trainings. And then at the bottom of this page is where you can find them for the last two years. And again, we're going to go over the February ones. And I'm going to start with the USAS bug fixes. This was a report, a bug fix for a custom report definition that the district created. But when they used the control header on the date field, it threw an error. So the developers fixed that when they found the formatting error. And another bug fix that was corrected was the financial summary by fund report for those entities that don't have the general fund. So this is what the typical report looks like. And you can see that the general fund is up here and other funds are down below. But those um, ITCs that may be like a COG um, only have other funds 025. And so when this report was generated, it it was throwing an error for those specific um, that didn't have the general fund. Some improvements on the USAF side included um, the period H collection data. And this is the data that's pulled in through the SIF. Um, the ODE brief description will now appear blank for the fiscal year 23 EMIS change, 23-86. In addition, the payables value will now show as zero to prevent confusion. And the confusion was caused because the payable value is being populated by the, the current payables amount in USAS. So it didn't reflect the payables as of the fiscal year's collection period. However, ODE financial departments were not using that field anyway. So they're gonna remove it per ODE fiscal year 24 under change 2451. And then we had some uh, improvements regarding what, the you, what you see on a user. So I'm gonna go in, I'm under the USAS manager user. I'll pull up that user. You can see that you can see the full name over here and, or even on this side where sometimes it was cut off and you didn't know what it was, as well as the email. This isn't a good example, but it will show the whole email and not cut off on the screen. Let's see. The federal detail assistant view has also been in, uh, updated. So when you're creating one, these amounts will not include transfers or advance amounts for the 500 funds. So if any of these amounts have um, transfers included, um, they're not included in these numbers when they're automatically populated. Any questions on that? The ability to delete from the file archive has been implemented. And if you go into the file archive, you can delete all by clicking the top or you can choose like based on date possibly. So you see here, there's two reports. If you wanted to get rid of all the December reports, you could. But to be able to do this, 
there was a couple of roles and permissions that were updated or changed. So therefore, oh, and basically you would just click this and click this button and it would remove it with a warning. But to be able to do this, a specific role was added to the user. And I'm gonna go back to the user that I'm in. The role that is needed now to be able to do what I just did and delete is this USAS file archive manager. So before the USAS manager role um, could do it, now both these permissions are needed if you want this user to be able to delete any reports in the file archive. Uh, this was um, kind of implemented for, did I put that here? Yeah, the importance of the timing of these changes are related to the document management and archival project that they're working on. So basically they're taking what the documents are in the file archive for all the applications and putting it in a different database. So they're probably going to do this in the second quarter. So if ITCs or districts wanted to be able to clean up the file archives, they are not able to do this with that specific role. And then another, uh, let me go back in here. If, it was a previous change that didn't get implemented, but now <clears throat> if the report bundles are disabled and you go to close a month, it'll warn you. And it's just a warning, but you have to confirm is it so that you're aware that the report bundles are disabled. And then we had four specific district patches. One included um, that was related to the void old checks option that was removed on a previous release. Another patch specific to the district was um, paid POs that exceeded the encumbrance, but was also involved in the account change process. Another patch was for a specific district for uh, a job that failed. So they updated that status. And then another patch was for an account change bug and other classic migration issues. Well, that's all I have for USAS. Are there any questions? Okay, I'll stop sharing and USPS will be up. Thank you. screen. Okay. Um, welcome to Fridays with Frisco. I'm going to be going over the payroll issues for February. Um, we had three this month. We had uh, two just regular um, fixes, um, or releases, excuse me, and one hot fix. Um, so the first ones we're going to be going through are the bug fixes. Um, the first one was for a payroll item detail report where the gross wages were not always the same on the pre and, and then to the post the payroll, um, payroll item detail report. And this was for retirement for SIRS and STIRS. Um, so now they updated that and now the applicable gross is correct. So they will see um, the same grosses on the pre report and the post report on the payroll detail report. Um, one thing they did find when they were doing that testing that the total gross is still incorrect um, for some on the 400 and 450. So we did create a juror issue for that to um, correct that total gross for those payroll items. The next one was the attendance import service. 
Um, we had many districts that were asking to include the warning and errors in, on the actual screen and, the, and on the report. So right now it just shows on the error report, but they also wanted it to show on the screen down here below. I don't have one, but this is where you would see it would have a box here and it would show all the errors or warnings actually on the screen. Um, and that would match what would show on the error report also. So that was just a, something they added. The next one was a deferred dock improvement. Um, districts were seeing a lot of issues with um, if the districts were deleting their payroll and they had employees that had dock and deferred docks. It was not going back to future correctly. So they updated that bug fix. And now if they delete a payroll, the deferred docks will go back to the future payments grid. And in the description, they will see um, it would be called backup of deferred docked amount from deleted payrolls, keep exceptions. So then when they start the correct payroll and reinitialize, it will pull those back in and they won't lose them anymore. So that is, um, I think, a good fix for districts, be less confusing. The next one is on the ODGFS, um, on the posted pay report, the count was incorrect because what it was doing was excluding DOC employees. And we found that, that still they still need to include those employees, even though they're having a zero gross, um, that total ODGFS count needs to include them. So now on the pay report, that um, count is correct. The next thing they did, um, we were having districts come back after they were trying to submit their CCA submission file this year. Um, CCA actually updated the files for them this year, but for next year or this coming year, I should say for 2023 submissions, this is corrected now um, for non-Ohio um, residents. So, um, it will fill a space in in the state account number. That's what CCA was not liking. So in positions three and four, um, for Ohio employees, they have a 39. And then in positions 248 to 267, it's going to use our state ID number for Ohio. But for out-of-state employees, um, if it doesn't, the three, four has um, another ID number other than 39, then the system knows that it needs to fill these positions between 248 and 268 um, with blank spaces. So hopefully that will make CC, CCA happy for next year. The next one is the year to date report. Um, they, in a prior issue, I think it was, they accidentally deleted something. Um, and it was causing an issue when a district was running a year-to-day report. So when they were selecting a pay group, um, a no year-to-day report was being um, created and they found out this was due to a query that was um, deleted. So they reinstated that, restored it, and now that issue has been corrected, that bug. The earnings register and the account history reports under SSDT um, homepage, um, they was not handing the percentages correctly. So what they did then, and this was in about around February 10th, they did a release um, on a Saturday where they went in and um, for prior historical payroll accounts, um, they did a update where now you will see um, the percentages. So for historical and for upcoming um, reports when they run them, now they will see on the earnings register, you're gonna see what kind of type, if it's at R, regular, S specific. And it also, if in the percentage, so what percentage of that pay account is going for that, um, the charging that amount? Is 100% or breaking it down? So now they will see that on the earnings register. Um, on the employees total part of the earnings register, um, all it's going to show now is just those account numbers, payroll account numbers, and then the charge amount. It's not gonna show a position number or it's not gonna show a charge type like it does up here in the um, breakdown of the earnings register for the employee and not a percentage. So that is not no longer on the employee total section. On the account history and the version two account history, 
now when they run those uh, reports, that percentage is correct because before it was either not showing or it was not correct. So that should be correct now. Um, the next one was we had a lot of districts having issues um, with apostrophe characters in uh, like last names or in a description of a um, import um, when they were running an attendance absence import. Um, so it was a bug that did not like that apostrophe in the CSV. So that has been cor um, corrected now. So now they can have apostrophes in the last name, for example, and it should not cause any more issues. The next one was the year to day report. Um, we had a district notice that employees were being skipped um, during um, when they were running this report. And it was selecting, when they were trying to select that include compensation information on report flag, when they were selecting that option, um, it was due to no contract work days. And they found it was uh, mostly with legacy compensations because they, you know, sometimes don't, they don't have contract work days, like we need to have them now in our redesign. So they fixed that bug. So now the system um, will include those employees um, that don't want, that don't have that non-contract work days. The EMIS position, um, non-contract compensation work days count um, was incorrect. Um, it should be limiting them to just that fiscal year, but what it was doing, if it was on a job calendar with days and no start or stop days, then the software was just um, going out and counting years of days. And that's incorrect. So what they did, they decided to use the US uh, EMIS reporting configuration screen option. And now when that is set, um, it knows what fiscal year they're in and it knows um, when to start their count. So they should not have a problem with those kind of contracts anymore. Um, any question on the bug fixes? Before we go into improvements. Okay, uh, the next one is improvements. Um, we did a, they did an improvement on the file archiving on, on how to handle when a district is running a December payroll, but running it in January, like the system date, and what they were finding out that it was putting them in the wrong calendar year. It was throwing them into 2023 when it should still be running in December of 2022 because that's what the pay was still. So what they did, they updated that. So the file archive will look at the pay date now and not the system date. So now they should not see that next year when they're running those pays in between those two months. The earnings register, um, you want to add um, the added employee leave totals for Medicare pickup. Um, we had a lot of um, districts that are wanting that broken down on the employee um, earnings register. So now when they run it for employees, they're going to see the 692, and it's going to be called employer pickup. That's a full pickup employee. And then it's going to show the amount of what the, um, the board is picking up still under the employee portion. And then they're going to see the total of the two together here. So that'd be an employee portion plus the employer portion. So they're going to see that. Um, now, if they had an employee that was partial pickup, they would see a line that says Medicare, and then they're also going to see a line for employer pickup. So um, that still is going to be broke down if they do a partial. I don't know how many districts do a partial pickup anymore for Medicare, but that is out there. That will show separately. Um, and then on the employees total at the bottom of the earnings register, um, the employees total on the report on the pay item will show the employer pickup. So again, it will show what the, um, the board is picking up for the employee, just that portion. And then it's gonna do a total of the two for the employer amount plus the employee amount in that line. So then at the bottom of the earnings register for the report totals by pay item section, then they're gonna see, again, you're gonna see regular Medicare people that are you know paid their portion and the board pays their portion, uh, their portion side. And then also you're going to see the employer pick up. So hopefully this will help districts in balancing. 
The next one is the compensation unit amount. Um, let's see, this one was, okay, they did an update. So if a non, if the unit amount is um, zero or blank, um, they added a check now. So now you can't have a unit amount with a blank. They have to have an amount in there and they will get an error when they're running payroll on the error report and it will be a pay amount rate non-zero. Rate must not equal zero and it would say, you know, the employee and what position number that they have to fix. So just let your districts know they may be seeing this new error and this is why. Um, the SERS new hire, um, there had to been an update that new SERS new hire is requiring now, um, the email address. So we use the other email address. So they wanna make sure that um, has an address um, filled in in the employee screen, because that is required for reporting now. And then they just did why they updated that. They changed the work phone because that's what the payor, that report was looking at, was looking at the work phone number. And we just um, instead used the home phone. So now, because most of the time the home phone is gonna be their cell number. And I think that's what the um, SERS is now requiring. So we just moved that. So the report is looking at the home phone now and not the work phone. The next one is the EMIS employee. Um, they were having some issues um, on the checks and balances of um, if they had a blank EMIS ID number was involved for employee. So now what they did, they had, so how the data collector includes a credential ID when it's looking, it, if there is a credential ID or EMIS ID filled in, it's going to use one of those. If there is a space in the credential ID for the EMIS soap service, it's going to go back and try to uh, and retrieve a ZID for the employee. So create a new ZID because it's no credential ID. So the system knows it needs to get one. Um, if the EMIS ID is spaces, and then it will use the credential ID. So it's just kind of check and balance and it's just going back and um, circling around and trying to find um, what to use. So they did an improvement on that. So hopefully that will um, correct some issues that we were having with people, uh, districts having spaces in these fields and causing errors when they were trying to submit it into the data collector. Okay, any questions on improvements? Um, the only other thing we have for new feature, and this was a behind the scenes, so there was nothing from that you guys would see. And so nothing to talk about on that one. Andrea, I have a question. Oh, sure. Um, the, the, the volume. I'm sorry, what was I? Go ahead. Um, the SERS new hire report, the email address that is the other that you're listed there, is that yes. that third email address? So is SCRES using that for their email address now? Uh, yes, the other, because I think there was, we have three out there, right? Primary, yeah. secondary, and the other. So yes, so the other email address is what they're using. So they'll have to make sure that is updated with the email address. That's and cool. they can use mass load to, uh, to um, update that if they're not using it right now. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, any other questions? I have a question um, actually for Pat or Amanda back on you. Oh, sure. I'm sorry. That's fine. Go ahead. If, um, if they're listening. Yeah. <laughs> um, on the deleting the archive reports, um, do you have any recommendations for districts that, uh, you know, they've opened and closed maybe the fiscal year several times or their months several times? And if we want to get rid of extra copies, is it better to delete the newer ones or the older ones? Or is it like on a case by case basis that you would look at that? I don't, do you have any recommendations? Um, um, I, can, I can chime in to get us started on here, but I don't know if Pat or Michelle have any, anything additional. Um, you know, I, I think that as far as cleaning them up, um, I'm not sure, uh, I know Pat mentioned like moving to a separate um, like document um, 
database eventually. So I'm not sure if we may have a more like official recommendation down the line. Um, so just kind of <laughs> my thoughts for now, but that's, we may possibly have something um, like that. Um, I would think that it is a case by case basis uh, because it really depends on why there are multiples out in any given month. So if it was real, so say a month was closed and everything was set and then it was like nothing really changed and it was opened and reclosed on like by accident, then you may want the original, you know, copies there. If there was a case where something was changed, like it was reopened specifically to change something, then you probably want the newest copies and delete the oldest ones. Um, obviously, looking back, you might not always know that. So, yeah, I think it kind of, you know, depends on the situation and maybe even just uh, comparing some of the reports, like, you know, for the main totals, like, obviously, if they're all the same, then um, it could go either way. So I know that's kind of a vague answer, but my my thoughts <laughs> for just uh, the basics there. Because some districts might even want to keep all copies. That's where I hesitated in answering yeah. too. Good point. Because I don't think I would delete any if I changed transactions so that I would have that history. But then again, you have that audit report too. So Hopefully we answered your question. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, if there's no other questions, I'll go ahead and send it over to Michelle um, and she'll be doing the inventory. Good morning, everybody. Hope you can hear me okay. Um, I'm gonna go over uh, just briefly the inventory um, release one that just went out um, in February. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit more about upcoming training sessions that are going to take place. Um, with um, February, we had the 1.32 release for inventory. Just had a couple things on there, um, a couple bug fixes. Um, we had a little annoying thing that was happening when you were splitting um, an item. It was making you close the window and reopen it in order to um, complete the split, um, and we fixed that. Also, um, we fixed a bug uh, preventing the item's capitalization status from being updated. Um, if they went in and added an act, um, after if they went in and um, deleted an acquisition thus causing the item to no longer be capitalized, the status was still showing as capitalized. So we fixed that so that it automatically updates the status. Um, so those were the two bug fixes that we took care of on 1.32. Um, for improvements, um, we had a good discussion about the first one. Um, for items that you have out there that are capitalized that were added in prior years, if the cap status was changed, if you ran cap criteria, and it changed the status of those items during the current year, um, the changes are now going to be reflected in the adjustment column on the gap uh, schedule of changes reports, the schedule of change in fixed asset and the schedule of change in depreciation. Before what was happening, is it was adjusting the beginning balance. And you know what that does then, that cause issues with prior year's ending balances because they no longer match. So instead of updating that beginning balance field, when you've made some kind of change in the system that resulted in an item no longer being capitalized, it's making those adjustments in the adjustments column. Doesn't affect the beginning balance anymore. Um, so um, if the item was changed from non-cap to cap, then it's going to show us a positive amount on the adjustments column. If it was showing that it was changed from cap to non-cap, it's going to be a negative amount on the adjustments column. So that will help, um, especially at year end. And when they're running reports for the prior year versus the new year, um, and, you know, especially during audit, when the um, auditors are checking those ending balances against those beginning balances, you know, if changes were made in the cap status, obviously, 
you know, it's not going to affect those beginning balances anymore. So, um, so those will stay intact and continue to balance with the prior year's ending balances. Um, so we um, did make that update on this last release. And also we implemented logging of authentication events. So just like we, we have with USAS and payroll, um, the app log, the application log is now updated to show any successful or failed login attempts. That was again, something that was requested by audits um, in order to put those on there. So that is now appearing on the application log. Um, so those were the um, only uh, options that we had available for, um, or the only updates that were made for the 1.32 release. Uh, we did not have any updates for the ITCM application um, this past month, so nothing to report there. Do you have any questions regarding um, the inventory release? Okay, um, just a quick um, update on what's happening with our trainings uh, coming up. Um, March and April are going to be very busy. Uh, we do have our overview sessions taking place in March. So you can see um, we have these sessions for you guys. And I, you know, I'd send an email message about how we're kind of changing it up. And I know I've talked about it before, um, but we're kind of changing up how we're doing the overview. Um, and you can call the beginner session if you want. But you know, for those of you that are still getting comfortable with the new, you know, redesign, um, this might be a good session, a refresher, just to um, just show you, um, you know, all the different uh, options and available that are in the um, applications. So how we're going to do this with payroll next week is we're going to be doing um, kind of a preparing for the payroll and discussing all the different options um, and steps that are um, involved. And so, you know, we're kind of taking the payroll checklist and dividing that into three different days um, and then just going over those areas. And so obviously when you're talking about preparing for the payroll, it involves a lot of the things that we used to talk about in our quote beginner um, sessions that we did in the past. Um, so we're gonna tackle preparing the payroll. And then the second um, USPS overview session is gonna be the actual payroll process. And then that last day we're gonna cover, you know, the different things on the checklist after the payroll has been processed. Um, so that's kind of how we're going to approach it this time. Now, these sessions may run an hour and a half. They may run almost up to three hours. We're not sure, you know, it's our first year doing this. So kind of bear with us, but we're hoping to kind of keep things a little more condensed than we have in the past, um, but we can't make any promises. Um, but um, that's kind of how we're, we're starting um, or attacking it this year. And so, that's payroll is next week. And then the following week, we are doing the USAS overviews. So again, different approach. We're going to be talking about managing accounts and all of that that's involved with that on the first day. And then our second day, we're gonna be covering the expenditure process. So it's not just you know, talking about POs and you know, AP invoices and checks, and, but everything that's involved with that. Um, vendors can get affected. Um, the reports that could be involved. So, you know, that'll all be covered throughout that expenditure process. And then our final day for uh, USAS will be reviewing the receipt process and going over that. Um, and so then we're kind of taking a break at that point until the beginning of April. Obviously we'll do our, our March recap that first Friday. And then we'll get into um, doing an inventory overview uh, mid-April. So the first day we'll be discussing the transaction processing, um, creating an item and how to maintain an item and the split of an item and stuff like that. Um, so we'll be going through those different options available, acquisitions, dispositions, trans, uh, trans, uh, transfers. So those will all be um, discussed that first day. Um, the second day, we'll get just more familiar about the gap reports and some of the frequently used non-gap reports and just talk about um, when those reports are run, where is that information coming from? Stuff like that. Um, the third day, we are going to be doing a depreciation, talking about depreciation um, and just the calculations involved with the depreciation and the different options in uh, the application that can recalculate depreciation. So that's kind of what we're focusing on 
um, for that. And then we're gonna finish up April with uh, new contract salary notices. We're gonna be going over that on the 21st. And then we're going to be covering the transfers and advances in USAS. And we're gonna be covering that at the end of April. So we have a lot going on with training and we're really hoping that you all have some time to uh, go through those. Um, just to kind of, I'm gonna go into the actual um, training page. Obviously you guys know where to register for our training sessions here. Um, and just going back to that overview, um, we are going to, um, like our, our training materials and stuff like that, you know, we're, we're trying to add those in here as we can, or we link them in the supporting materials column as well. Um, but um, regarding that overview session, you know, what we're doing is we're going to be revamping what this is here. This is still the information from last year. So we're kind of adding to that, if you will. Um, we're going to update that and basically provide, this is kind of what we've got going on right now, is like, here is what we're going to be covering for USPS during the overview, for USAS, and for inventory. So, you know, right now, this is not um, available for you guys to see. This is what we're working on right now. Um, and so basically, we're going to have like, you know, here's the agenda. Here's the uh, PowerPoint that we're going to have, um, stuff like that. We're going to have, you know, our Obviously our user manuals haven't changed links to those. And then we're gonna have our recordings here um, for each day. And so what we're hoping to do then after everything is complete and all of these been, have been recorded is we're gonna go in and actually break down these recordings um, into the different sections that we talked about and provide links to those um, recordings. So if a user wants to like, you know, you have a district person that's new to requisitions. Um, they'll be able to go right into that area that we talk about requisitions during the expenditure process and click right on that, that section of the recording and get some information about that. Um, so we're trying to um, provide this so that you guys can, you know, obviously you guys are still doing your trainings, you know, with your districts, but this is kind of a, an extra thing that they can, go to and look at this um, and get just more information about a certain process um, in our applications. Um, so, you know, we will be adding, this is all gonna be kind of changing, um, but we will be adding those links. And then once that's all done, um, we'll announce it in a newsletter for sure so that everybody can see that. Um, and that, you know, your districts then will have direct access to um, these recordings as well. Um, they're always out there on YouTube and stuff, but it's just another way um, of getting that information directly within our wiki. So um, I think that's all I have. Um, do you guys have any questions about any of our upcoming training sessions? Okay, well, I think we are um, all done with our recap. Um, and I want to thank you guys for attending. And we all hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. And we will see you here uh, next week. Thanks, everyone. Good job. <laughs>